Oh, I should probably start a stopwatch too because I don't know how long I'm. I I go over a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I need to start a stopwatch. Okay. Okay, we're good. Recording. All right. So welcome everyone. This is Women Who Code San Diego Interview Prep, and today we are going to talk about big O strings and arrays. Woo! All right. So let's get started. Okay. So if you have not been here before. Um, this is a series that we do on technical interviews. Um, and if you haven't been to a technical interview, they're basically designed to get a sense of how well you can problem solve. And there's a, a lot of different, um, not a lot, really, there's three, but there's three different formats that you can take when you're doing a technical interview. You can do one that's a take home. So maybe they'll send you like a hacker rank or like a, I think it's like a codability thing that you can do at home. Um, there is a live coding assessment where you're online and you're doing it with the, the person, the person on staff and solving the problem together. And really most of them are going to be like this, either take home or live coding just because, you know, COVID, right? Um, but pre-COVID, there were also whiteboard interviews where you would solve the problem in person and actually write on the whiteboard um, the your algorithm to solving the um, challenge. And, you know, pre-COVID when we um, when we did these meetups, we would actually do them on whiteboards. Um, but it's okay, we adjust. And the main two formats is take home and live coding. And the main focus for them and really for you as the person solving the challenge is first, can you solve the problem, right? Like, how well can you solve this algorithm? But also how efficient is your algorithm? Like how much time and space does your algorithm consume? And that's what we're gonna talk about when we talk about big O. Um, and then finally, it's actually not on here. I, I've modified these slides since, but communication. Like how well can you communicate to your interviewer your thought process in solving the problem? So like, are you just super silent and just like, you know, doing it by yourself um, when you're, interviewer gives you hints like are you actually listening to them and, and following them like are you communicating well like that's what they want to know as well because they want to see what you're going to be like as a co-worker um, so those are the th those are the main uh, points that you should think about when doing a technical interview so how will this series help um, so it's a series of events that will help you learn and practice um, and get confident with their algorithm skills. Like I truly believe that practice makes competent and practice makes confident. Um, so these series or this series of events is designed to help you practice and gain confidence. Um, okay, quick note here. So we used to alternate between lectures and practice sessions. I will be taking a break. <laughs> um, so we are going to put the lectures on pause until next summer. Um, but it's okay because all of this is recorded. Um, this is also recorded. <laughs> so you, you'll have the material. Um, we'll just be doing the practice sessions for the next few times. Um, and it also gives you a chance to network with fellow developers. Like I am so happy when I get to see repeat people um, multiple times um, and I really feel like I get to know you. Um, so um, it's great when you all keep coming and get to know each other. So that's awesome. All right, the algorithm design template. So when you're, okay, so you go to your technical interview, they give you an algorithm and you're like, okay, I'm gonna get started. One mistake that people do is that they just start coding. <laughs> and the thing is you really don't want to do that. Um, oh, I guess that's, there's another slide that goes over this. <laughs> um, so at, at best, it doesn't give the interviewer an opportunity to see your thought process and who you are as, you know, an engineer. Um, at worst, it your solution is wrong and you really don't have a way to get out of it. Like you spent all this time coding and now it's like, oh, you realize that you've got a bunch of bugs and you don't know where to go from there. So the algorithm design template is designed to slow you down and really just help you think of your design process before coding. Um, so that way, if there's any mistakes, if there's any bugs in your code, you could potentially catch that before you start coding. All right, did I cover all of this? Um, oh, yes. It also helps you 
think out the problem out loud. So the, the interviewer knows what you're thinking. So you're with the algorithm design template, you're not going to just like write it, but you're going to say, okay, so I know that my problem is this. And I know that you want me to return this. Like it helps you sort of give you that script to give to the interviewer as you solve the, the problem. Oh, and another thing, uh, this algorithm designing template was actually made by Jeff Zelensky, who's here in San Diego. Um, if you go to the Cracking the Coding interview meetup here in San Diego, I think he hosts on Wednesdays, um, that's him. So this is, this is uh, his template, and thank you so much, Jeff, for loaning it over to Women Who Code. All right, so this is what it looks like. Um, it makes more sense, this format, if you're actually physically in front of a whiteboard. Um, but we have a way to help you remember um, in a digital space. And that is the um, device PyRecMit, and I'll go through that. So PyRecMit, so P, problem, understand the goal. So one thing that you want to do when you get the, um, get the challenge is to say, okay, what is this actually asking me to do? Like, at the core of this, what is this asking me to do? Now, today we're going to go over very simple problems, and it's going to be, like, very simple, like, reverse a string. What is the problem? Reverse a string. But sometimes you're going to have really just, like, sort of thick, <laughs> long, you know, problems, and it's going to be hard for you to, like, realize, like, okay, what is this asking? And that's when you ask, yourself, ask yourself, okay, really, what does this person want me to do? So P, what is this, what is this like trying, what is this asking? Like, what is it trying to do? Um, this is also the opportunity for you to ask clarifying questions. So, you know, maybe you can ask the interviewer, okay, so do you want me to do this? You want me to re reverse the string? Do you want me to do it in, in place? Uh, should I make a new string? Um, I don't know, like, are there any time constraints or stuff like that? If you have any sort of questions, this is the point for you to ask as well. Um, asking clarifying questions is very, very important. And actually, a lot of times it's part of the point system that they use, I mean, informal point system that they use to see whether or not you show signs of being a good engineer. Because you don't ever just want to start coding and assume you know what you're doing. You want, you want to ask questions to truly understand. Um, and then find patterns. So if you keep coming to these events, or e not honestly, not even if you keep coming to these these, these events, if you keep coming to, um, or if you keep practicing these um, problems, you're going to start seeing a lot of patterns. Um, we're going to go over one technique called the um, two-pointer technique, which is a really useful technique to use when solving string or array problems. And so when you're looking at the problem, one of the things to ask yourself is like, okay, let me go through my like toolbox here. Like, is this a problem that could use the two pointer technique? This is a problem that can use uh, depth first search or breadth first search, or perhaps it can use a stack or a queue. Like that's that toolbox. Like you just keep going through all of your toolboxes, your tools and think, okay, can I use this? Mm, no, throw it out. Okay, right, can I use this? Mm, no, throw it out. Um, so that's what this part is for. And the thing is, like, it, if this is your first time doing this, it's going to seem a little bit overwhelming. But, like, I promise you, like, as you keep practicing over and over and over, it's just going to kind of, like, come automatic. Okay. Pi rec mit. I. Inputs. Um, determine what your input should receive. Sounds super simple. Don't forget it. Because <laughs> you never want to, like, work on your problem and just say, wait, what kind of data am I supposed to get? Determine that ahead of time. Okay. Return. What should your data return? Um, should it return an integer, a Boolean? Should it be in place and not return anything at all? Um, don't forget to return your data points. <laughs> There's actually recordings of me teaching these classes where I forget to return the actual data points. So that's something to remember as well. Okay, PyRecMit. E, examples, errors, and edge cases. So I definitely think that this is probably one of the most important parts of the Pyrec Mint um, device. Um, and that is you want to create your own examples. Um, because when you test your code, it's going to 
help you run through it and see if it's actually like working. So what you want to do is you want to create your own examples and you want to create your expected output. So if I say, hey, reverse a string, I'm going to give you an example of what I mean, but don't just depend on the interviewer's example. You want to create your own string examples too. So if the string I gave you is hello, then you're going to say, okay, well, I'm going to try the string like, how are you doing? You know, that contains white space. Um, and maybe that's a great point to ask, okay, so what do we do with white space? Um, or maybe you want to start using some edge cases. Like, what should you, what is the expected output when your um, input is null? Um, things like that. Let's see. Oh, another point. Acknowledge the edge cases, but don't spend a lot of time working on them. So a mistake that people do, a mistake that I often do, is I spend so much time thinking of the examples and edge cases that I'm just sort of like uh, stuck because you can think of all the sort of things that can potentially break your code, right? And remember, you've got a time limit. You don't want to spend your whole time thinking of you know, all of the ways that your code can go wrong. It's great to acknowledge it. Um, but one thing that someone told me, um, an interviewer actually told me is, design for the best case scenario and then go back and build in the things that will um, mitigate your edge cases, right? So like if, you're, if your code, um, if you design for the best case scenario and you realize you get a null input and it just breaks everything, Put, so put your code down <laughs> that's going to be for the best case scenario first and then go back and fix it later. Because at the end of the day, you want code that's gonna run. Okay, maybe it doesn't run for like, like 10 out of 10 cases, but at least it runs for eight out of 10 cases and that's okay for now. Like literally like I just did like a Twitch interview where like <laughs> it only ran seven out of like 10 cases and I was like, oh, well, there goes back. There goes that, but they called me back and they're not looking for perfection. They're looking to see like how well you're gonna do. Okay, constraints and maintenance. Um, pi rec mint, constraints. So did the interviewer give you specific problem constraints? Um, maybe they're gonna say, hey, we want you to reverse the string, but you gotta do it in constant time. That's a joke, you can't do that. Um, <laughs> but like maybe they'll give you space restrictions, like you have to do it in place. Um, that's something that you have to keep in mind. Um, if they don't give you any time or space constrictions, your time and space restriction by default is in as less time and as less space as possible, right? You, you want to be um, as efficient as possible. Don't necessarily stress too much on the space um, efficiency, just because space data can storage can be a little bit cheaper, but definitely on the time you want to do it in as less time as possible. Even though you solve the problem, if you're doing it in exponential time, like your interviewer is not going to be really pleased. Um, maintenance. So what data do you want to keep track of? Um, do you, if it's a two pointer technique, obviously you're going to keep point track of your pointers. Um, maybe you have an output variable that you need to keep track of. Maybe you have an output array that you need to keep track of or a dictionary. Um, keep note about ahead of time. Okay, idea number one, idea number two. So your first idea is going to be the most inefficient brute force like method possible. And that's okay. Pseudocode it um, because at the end of the day, if you cannot think of something better, then it's better to have something than nothing at all, right? So like if you're <laughs> if you're doing it in exponential time and it's like just taking up a lot of time, it's super slow, but you really cannot think of anything better, then you know what? Just acknowledge it. Even I would even comment it and just be like, hey, I know this can be better. Like I know that there's a better way to do this, but this is what I've got. So I'm just gonna go with this. And that's fine. You know, like when I'm doing my my technical interviews, especially like the take home assessments, like I'm commenting my thought process. So even if it's not perfect, perfect, I would say, hey, this is what I would do if given more time. Um, and they can appreciate that. OK, test, test your algorithms. Um, so remember when we said examples and edge cases and stuff like that, this is the point once you once you pseudocode your first idea, once you pseudocode your second idea, 
then you're going to go through and you're going to run through and in your head think like, okay, how would this behave? And then go ahead and implement it. Um, and hopefully you all created Replit accounts so that you'll be able to implement your code. I'm, I'm sure a majority of you have made it. So even if you personally haven't, I'm sure someone in your group has. So um, you'll be able to implement your code, hopefully. All right, so here's it all in a nutshell. Um, Pi recmit, problem, input, return, examples and edges, constraints, maintenance, ideas, and tests. Um, and by the way, these slides are gonna be available to you. So if you don't remember, no worries, like come back, look it over, use it when you're practicing on your own and just remember Pi recmit, Pi recmit. Okay, cool. Let's get into the meat of things. All right, so Big O. What the heck is Big O? <laughs> so Big O is a tool that we use to describe how fast a function is growing as you increase the data size. Now, what the heck does that mean? So you have a function, right? And you're gonna get a, an input and it's gonna have a size. Maybe it's like, an array of a size with 10 elements. Maybe it's a string with like 10 characters. I don't know. You're going to have some sort of input that you need to process and it has a size. Now, if you increase the size of the input, like let's just go to the example of an array with 10 elements, right? You have a you have a an array of 10 elements and you're going to process that element. The you're going to process the array of 10 elements. If you double it, so if you go from 10 elements to 20 elements, how many more operations does it take to process that data, right? Um, it doesn't, just because it's you double the size doesn't mean you're necessarily going to double the amount of operations. Um, and that's what big O is. Because if you double the size of the input and it like exponentially increases the amount of operations, that's super slow, right? And so big O is a way for you to kind of judge how good a an algorithm is. And if you judge it as not being that great, you can work on a more efficient way of doing it. Um, it's also a way to judge an algorithm independent of the platform that you're using. So you know, if you use a different language, like say you're using a C-based language, like say, say you're just using C, it's so low on the stack that C is gonna, probably gonna be the most fastest way to do any sort of um, algorithm versus Python, which is like super high on this um, on the stack. And so it's gonna take a lot longer to get things done. But you wanna be able to judge an algorithm, you know, independent of the language or the actual computer. So like if someone has a really slow computer and I have a really fast computer, like you don't wanna say like, oh, well, the amount of time it takes to run is 48 seconds, milliseconds on my computer. Like that's not really helpful. Like you need something that's going to be a lot more universal. So no matter which computer you use, no matter which language you use, you know that it is the most efficient way of doing it universally. Um, we also call this time complexity or space complexity. So you'll hear big O, but sometimes they'll say like, okay, what's the space complexity of this? Or what's the time complexity of this. That's that's another way of saying, what is the big O for this? And um, N is the size of the data input. So if it's an array of 10,000 items, N is 10,000. Okay, so here's a quick little chart that tells you a little bit about um, what the common growth orders are and how they rate in terms of how good they are. So, up at the top in the green section here is constant, right? Like if you're doing it in constant time, it's amazing because no matter what, it's gonna be the same amount of operations. That's so efficient, love it. Um, all the way at the bottom here and in this like super <laughs> red area is factorial. Um, I don't even know a factorial <laughs> like algorithm to be quite honest. Like my my knowledge doesn't, I, I can't think of one, but if you do somehow manage to create one, throw it away because <laughs> it's not gonna be efficient, it's gonna be super slow, and it's not gonna really be helpful to anyone at all. Um, okay, so before I go through all of these, 
I actually want to test what you already know. So let's take a look at some, we're gonna do a little pop quiz. Let's take a look at some growth or some equations. What am I saying? Functions, my goodness, I can't speak today. Let's take a look at some functions and then determine what the time complexity is. So if you can figure it out, drop in the chat. I'm gonna talk about it and then drop it in the chat if you know. Okay, so this is in Java, by the way. So sorry if you don't code in Java, but I feel like it's pretty easy to understand. So here you've got um, a, a function here and it's called insert at n. And it takes in an array of strings and it inserts a value at a specific index. So we've got, you know, insert at n sum list 10. So it inserts at index 10, we have sum list 100, so it ins inserts at index 100. And here we've got insert at 10,000. So what is the time complexity of this? I'm looking in the chat. Just guess, it's all, it's all, we're all family here. <laughs> I'm gonna wait for a couple more guesses. Okay, cool. Yes, everyone has it. It's constant. Woo. Um, why? Because when you're dealing with an array, no matter what, inserting at a specific index is always constant time. It's just one operation. It doesn't matter if you're inserting at index 50 or 10,000 or 1 million, it's always the same. So when you're looking for a constant, um, if you know that a function is constant if there are no loops based on in input size. So you don't see any for, you know, for this of this, none of that. It's just, it's just a loop that does not depend on input size or no loops at all. Um, definitely no recursion and no function calls with operations that scale by input size. Um, okay, my little note here, watch out for built-in functions. So if anyone, codes in Python, um, and you look at the runtime of Python. So first of all, Python doesn't have arrays, they have lists. And what they are, lists are, are actually dynamic arrays. So if you work with arrays, you know that they're static, right? And it's, it's complete, every operation is constant. But dynamic arrays, when you fill up the array and you want to add another element, what it does is that it creates a new array and then it copies over from the old array to the new array. And that copying over is actually linear time. So if you're ever doing um, a technical interview and you're coding in Python, just acknowledge to the person like, this is averaged out to be constant time. I know, <laughs> I know that technically it's not constant time just because that process of going from um, that dynamic array operation is linear, but for the most part, it is constant. Um, so just, just keep that in mind. Okay, another one. So we've got a function here called sum list and it takes an array of integers and it goes through each integer. So it iterates through each integer in the list and it, or by each, yeah, each integer in the list. And then it goes and it adds them together and then it returns the total. What is the time? Comp oh, you guys are already answering. Okay, cool. <laughs> Never mind. Excuse me. Okay, yes, <laughs> it is linear time. And the reason why it's linear time because you're adding every single one in the list. It does. If you if you add one to the list, the the number of operations that you do increases by one. If you double the list, the number of operations that you do doubles because you literally have to go through each one and add them together. What to look for when to know that it's linear? Um, a loop that contains operations at constant time, so inside it's a constant amount of operations, and it scales with size n. Um, so basically if you see anything that's like for i in range n, or like, you know, while, you know, something, and the something is the actual input size, um, that's something to look for to know that it's linear. Okay, 
Another one. So we have some list again, same thing as before, but instead of just going one by one, like before we had, um, oh, how do I go backwards here? No! Okay. <laughs> you saw it. <laughs> okay. But instead of going one one by one, so like we have I plus plus, it's going I, it's increasing by I equals I times two. What is it? <laughs> I, I'm, I mean, I, I'm sure you all saw it. <laughs> It's logarithmic. And the reason I didn't want you to see it <laughs> is because something that um, people often say for this one is that it's constant time, right? And, oh my gosh, why can't I go backwards? What the heck? Okay, now it's working. So something that people often say is that, oh, this is, this is logarithmic because it's increasing by two. That means it's one half uh, the constant or one half n right and actually no that's not the case because if you actually look at it um and the number of operations if it's if it's constant time like if it's one if the run time is half n what that means is that as you keep increasing the number of operations should be half of the data size but when you actually look at it the number of um, operations it actually increases logarithmically so so when you do um i wonder if i should write this out uh, i don't have time i'm going to write this out in the comments later but just you're going to have to just trust me for now <laughs> but when you do um when n equals in this in this specific thing here when n equals two you're doing one operation okay fine when n equals four you're doing two operations okay fine but when n equals eight when you're doubling the amount of operations, it's actually only three operations that you do instead of four. And when n equals 16, it's not eight operations, which is half of 16, it's only four operations. And what it's showing is that it's only, as you're doubling the amount of the size of the input, it's only increasing by just a little, um, which means it's, increasing in logarithmic time. Um, so something to look out for to know um, when a function is logarithmic is basically what we just saw, a loop where the counter is divided by a constant. So here, here it's basically the counter is being divided by two essentially. Um, we or variable markers. So like um, we have, we're going over the two pointer technique today. If if you are going, if you have pointers and it's like skipping over, you know, then you're not going through the entire data size. You're throwing out data. And so basically what that means is that you're in, as the um, size of the input increases, because you're throwing out data, the number of operations that you're doing is going to increase um, in a logarithmic fashion. Um, another one is traversing through half of a data structure. So like if you're using binary trees, you're not you're not like traveling through each node. You're depending on which method you're use you're using, you're only going to really travel on like this side of the tree. Um, basically, to know that a function is logarithmic, know that if you're throwing out data as you're processing it, it's going to be logarithmic essentially. Honestly, that was probably the easiest way for me to say that, <laughs> but it's okay. You got everything. All right. So, O n log n. This is essentially a combination of O of n, which is linear, and O log n, which is logarithmic. So, this little function you see right here. So, basically, what it is is that it, you have on the outside loop, you've got your um, linear, but then on the inside, you've got your logarithmic um, function inside. So basically, it's a combination of an outer loop that's linear and an inner loop that's logarithmic, or vice versa, an outer loop that's logarithmic and a linear, an inner loop that's linear. Um, so that is what to look for. Um, if you're doing a sorting algorithm, 
most of them are going to be like 99.9% if you see a sorting algorithm just assume that it's O N of log N complexity. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to prove that to you today right now, um, but sorting algorithms for the most part are um, O N log N complexity. Polynomial, so this is similar to O of N, um, but it's like having an outer loop that's linear and an inner loop that's linear again. So basically what that means is like you're iter so like linear, you're iterating through every single data point. But as you iterate at each data point, you're iterating through it all again. So like you're going you're going through one point and you're iterating through the entire data set. And then you go to the next point and you're iterating through the entire data set. Um, obviously not the best. Sometimes you can't help it. Um, like we use methods like breadth first search or depth first search. Um, and those are gonna be polynomial time, but there's really no way of getting around it. But obviously it's not something you wanna strive for. If you're, if you're at polynomial, like try to do something else. And then there's exponential. Um, the only one that I really know that's exponential is like recursion. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know how to make an exponential function that's, that doesn't require recursion. Um, but the big point here is if you're evaluating your algorithm and you realize that it's at exponential time, stop <laughs> and look for something else. Um, because exponential time can only work at very, very, very small input sizes. As you keep increasing the input size, the, the number of operations start to get way crazier. And a famous one is the Fibonacci sequence. Um, if you've ever done it before, um, there's a way to do it. Um, that doesn't require recursion, but an easiest way to do it is through recursion. So like Fibonacci, it's like the a number in a series is the two previous numbers in the series added together. Um, so that's what this return function here is, right? And basically it keeps calling and it keeps calling and it keeps calling. There's all these calls, all these recursive calls, and it just gets astronomical in, in terms of the number of operations that you have to do. So if you have an exponential function, stop what you're doing, try again. <laughs> all right, strings and arrays. So strings and arrays are honestly probably the most like easiest data structures that you can work with. Um, arrays, I love arrays. They're super simple. <laughs> um, all of their operations are at constant time. Um, but if you haven't worked with arrays yet, they're basically a collection of elements of one data type. I don't know why I said usually of one data type. I think they have to be one data type if you're using an array. There's other things like array lists where you can you know mix them up, but arrays have to be one data type. Um, Arrays are referenced by index and we start at zero. So if you look at this little picture here, um, if you are if you want to access the um, A of three, um, which is one, two, three, four, the fourth index, but it's we call it A of three, that's gonna be 76, not 75. <laughs> but if you're, even though there's five elements here, there is no such thing as A of five. It's out of bounds. Um, the fifth, element is actually um, a great movie, but it's going to be 91 and it's A of four. And you have four standard operations. You've got insert, which is ins inserting something into a slot, um, retrieve, grabbing the data that's stored at that slot, update, so changing the data at that slot and getting the size. Those are all constant operations. And strings, the reason why we do strings and arrays together is because they're super, super similar. Um, strings are a string of characters. So we've got this like um, sample word here, admirable, just like the word or just like the array where we've got slots for each element, we have slots for each character in the string. Um, so these below, are all examples of strings. It doesn't matter if it's white space, numbers, punctuation, those are all characters and those can all be included in this in a string. 
Um, and like arrays, strings are also indexed at zero. So if you want to grab the first character in a string, you have to grab the zero, the string at the zero if index. Okay. That's a little bit about strings. All right. The two pointer technique. Now we're getting like the fun stuff. Like what do we do with all of these strings? What do we do with the arrays? How do we process them? So if you get a string or array problem and you're at the pi rec mit right problem part of it is do i have something in my toolbox that can help me figure this out one of the things you should be asking yourself is can this be solved with a two-pointer technique can i solve this with a two-pointer technique and what does this mean so a lot of strings and array problems can be used with the two-pointer technique not all of them but you know, a good you can attempt um, to solve it with a two pointer technique. Now, it might not be the most efficient way, but it is something you have in your toolbox. Um, so, yeah, in the algorithm design template, when we say, have you seen this problem before? You have to ask yourself, is this a two pointer technique problem? Um, in part two of this lecture, uh, which we have recorded, we do go over more string and array techniques. Um, which means traversing 2D arrays. We haven't gone through sorting algorithms yet. TBD, at some point we'll do that. Okay, so two-pointer technique, what is it? It's basically the name, right? You have two pointers and you traverse through the array or the string. You can start at two pointers at the beginning and like maybe traverse this way, or you can start at two pointers at the end, traverse this way, or you can start at one pointer in the beginning, one at the end, and traverse this way. I mean, that's not even the only way to. You can start two, like, in the middle, traverse this way. Basically, what it is is that you have two pointers, and they are go moving through the array in different ways. Okay, let's go through an example. Reverse a string. You are given a string. Reverse all the characters on the string. We have two examples. We have hello world, and which, you know, goes into that reverse string. <laughs> and then we have women who code, which uh, outputs that reverse string. So what should we do first? What is the first thing that we need to do here? Um, go ahead and drop it in the chat. To solve this problem, what is the first thing that we need to do here? Good job, you all. Yes, it is to do pyrecmit. And the first part of pyrecmit is P, which is understand the problem. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So use the algorithm design template, pyrecmit. All right, let's go ahead and go over it together. I'm gonna do another share here. I'm gonna do my iPad here. Let me grab it. All right. Let me know if you can see my screen. Hello. Just drop in the chat. Perfect. Thanks, Bay. Hello, Bay. <laughs> um, all right, cool. So I oops, oops, I need to the answer. Bye, <laughs> so P. It's Reverse the string. I'm going to give it to you. It's reverse the string. That's the problem. There's, it's, it's very simple. There's nothing really much to do for that. Reverse the string. I mean, it's okay if I'm showing the answer. Okay. Um, I, input. What kind of input are you going to get? I'm going to open up the chat here. Perfect. You're going to get a string. R. What should you return? A string, exactly. We're moving along. Pi, rec, e, examples. So we have some here, but go ahead and give me an example of what another string that we could reverse. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Bay. So if we have the input ice, it should we should expect it to do ECI. Can you got race car and 
oh, look at you. I see what you did there. <laughs> um, we've got race car and race car. What is it called again? Um, I can't believe I forgot the name of it because I use it for every single example. Palindrome, thank you. Um, can anyone think of a an edge case? Something that's not really normal. Okay, we've got we've got a null. What should we return? Not negative one. Not null. Exactly. It's so okay, sorry. I shouldn't say it's null. That's actually incorrect of me to say. You have an empty string. <laughs> it's an empty string. So if you receive an empty string, then you return an empty string. Null is actually a different value altogether, but what you receive is an empty string. Sorry, that's that's incorrect. I should use proper terminology. Okay, can anyone think of any other edge cases? That's a great one, Angelica. So like you have just a character in the string and what should you return? I mean, I know you know, but put it down. Thank you. <laughs> okay, what's something, just another example that hasn't been shown yet. Um, something that includes, that will make it a little bit more difficult. Well, I mean, I guess we already said it in the other one actually. Um, and that's really, what I'm trying to get at is white space, right? Like you wanna make sure that when you reverse the string, the white space is in the correct places too. Okay, awesome. Um, constraints, do we have any constraints? Well, that's something to ask. And here it doesn't really say that you have to do it in place. I think the method that we're gonna do is gonna do it in place anyway, but um, there aren't any time or space constraints. So we're just gonna say as less as possible. <laughs> Pyrec mint. Are there any maintenance variables that we need to take care of? I'll give you a hint. It's in the name of this technique. <laughs> exactly. It's a two pointer technique problem. So you're going to keep track of your pointers. So maybe we're going to use something like I and J. All right. Um, we've got our idea number one, number two. So what's our first idea? Can anyone think of one? I'm gonna tell you what it is, but <laughs> can anyone think of one? Using two pointers, what is an idea that, that we can do? Let me take a look here. Perfect, yeah, that's a great one. So what we can do, oh, during through half an hour, yeah, yeah. So what we can do here is we can start with two pointers, maybe have one at the start because we're reversing the string, right? And what is reversing a string? It's basically taking the characters and swapping them. So we literally take the characters and swap them. So, okay, I don't like the, the thickness of this. Um, so like, let's take, maybe we've got I here and then J here, and then we have I go forward this way and J go backwards this way. And as long as I is less than J, then we keep swapping. That's pretty much the way to, way to do that. And so what would be the time complexity of that? No. Okay, here, I'm going to, I'm going to explain what we're doing. Um, so let's have I here and J here. I is going through each of these. And J is going through each of these. So if I made, if I doubled this, how many more operations would I do? 
So let's see. I know you're saying the answer, <laughs> but I'm going to wait till everyone's on board. <laughs> So if I'm, let's see, I'm going to go through like a, a very, like, let's just do like, hello. And I is here and J. So I is it, I is going, going here. Then I is going here. And then J is going here. And then J is going here. And then I and J are going to both meet up here. Right? So that's, let's see. One, how many, <laughs> how many characters were visited <laughs> here? Give me a number. <laughs> Five characters were visited, right? Okay. So let's say that we increase n we say instead of hello we say hello i'm going to just be simple and do it in one hello there so i is here j is here i is going to visit this one then this one then this one then this one then this one j is going to visit this one then this one then this one then this one then this one how many characters are visit or are, are visited and each visit is an operation. 10, right? I think there is five characters, 10. Oh, did I? Oh, I didn't include a space. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I try to make it easier without a space. So it's hello there, one word. So what's happening here? As you, as you increase the data, how, how many more operations are you doing? So, okay, <laughs> let's do one more. So let's do hello, and then the character I. <laughs> and we've got J right here, and we've got I right here. So I is gonna visit this one, this one, this one. J is going to visit this one, this one, this one. We increased, we increased the input by one. How many more times did we increase the number of characters that we visited? Yeah, we just increased the number of characters that we visited by one. So if we are visiting each character if we increase the data size by one and we increase the number of characters that we visit by one, and then if we double the amount of characters or the amount of characters that's in the input, and then we double the amount of characters that we visit, what, what kind of behavior is that? It's linear, right? Because the amount of operations that you do is in direct proportion to the amount of, um, is in direct proportion to the size of the input. So if you double the size, you double the amount of characters that you visit. If you only increase it by one, you only increase it, the number of characters by one. It's linear. It grows in, as, as you know, N, as N goes here, <laughs> it's the same amount of numbers here. So the plot is like this essentially, right? Okay, cool. So let's go. Well, I mean, I think we kind of went over <laughs> what the um, what the algorithm is. But if you have something like hello, and you've got your I pointer and your J pointer, what you're going to do is you're going to have something like, you know, temp, because you need something to hold it. You can't just do a direct spot. Someone someone's got to hold it. So you've got your I pointer. Is I less than J? Yes, we can keep going. Um, so J, we'll just say temp equals I. So temp is going to equal I. 
and then I is going to equal J. And then J is going to equal temp. Why did I put I? It's actually an H. <laughs> okay, is I less than J? Yes, we can keep going. So we're gonna move I over here and J over here. Okay, cool. So temp equals I, which is E. I equals J, which is L. And J equals temp, which is E. Is I less than J? Um, oh, wait, I said I did the check at the wrong part. But anyways, we keep going. You're actually supposed to do that at the beginning. So I is over here, but also J is over here. I is not less than J, so we know that it's flipped. And that's basically how you do the two pointers. You take them and then you swap until one is no longer less than the other. That means you've already um, traversed it. Um, and then you're fine. Now, here's something to point here. I did say you're you're going through each character. Technically, that's incorrect. <laughs> you're actually really going through half of the characters, right? Because going through each character would truly mean you're going, I is visiting this, I is visiting this, I is visiting this. And yes, J is visiting this, but the number of operations that we did here is actually really three, which means that the O N is not really, the, the big O is not really big O of N, it's actually O of one half of N. Um, so, Bay, yes, you're correct. <laughs> but with the thing is, when you're when you're talking about um, when you're talking about big of O, we're talking about really huge data sizes. And the thing is, half at at small sizes, half N maybe it makes a difference. But when you're processing like 10,000 you know characters the the half doesn't really matter so what we do is if we have a constant in front of the n like a, a half we just drop it and it's o of n okay cool so let's go ahead and go back to our little guy here and this is just an explanation would dot reverse be appropriate if testing in javascript honestly ask that's a question to ask your interviewer remember that understand the problem and we ask clarifying questions you can just straight up ask them like hey or reverse in python <laughs> this is correct just ask them hey is it okay if i just use the reverse function here okay i gotta move forward i'm taking a lot of time <laughs> okay so this is the two-pointer technique we just did it um this is the implementation Okay, good, it's practice time. I was worried that you didn't have enough time. <laughs> All right, so enough of me talking. I hope you understand the two-pointer technique and big O and arrays. Um, now, what we're going to do is to have you, um... <laughs> Adam says, the built-in functions of Python were written in C by people way smarter than this. We should use them, right? Yeah, I mean, okay, ask your interviewer. Because some some interviewers are like, yeah, just use the built-in function. Why not? I don't care. But some interviewers are like, well, I want to see, like, it's a mental exercise, right? Like, some of them are like, I want to see if you can do it without built-in functions, right? So ask, ask them. <laughs> All right. So we're going to go ahead and practice. And we're going to break you out into different groups. Um, and... Really quickly, I'm just gonna explain how this works because it can get kind of, um, if this is your first time, it can get kind of like, oh no, just kidding. Let me share the actual, <laughs> the actual, bio. what's going on with me? Oh, here we go. All right, so I'm gonna show you how this actually works. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to this um, bit.ly link and you're gonna go to bit.ly slash uh, woman who codes San Diego, big O. And they're going to have, or you're going to have these essentially whiteboards. Um, and that's where you, what you're going to use to design your algorithm. So the problem's going to be here. We're going to go over the problem. 
Um, but the problem is going to be here as well as PyREC Mint, and there's going to be spaces for you to actually, you know, think out your your design, the design of your algorithm, right? And then once you're done, you're going to go to Replit. Like once you're by done, I mean once you're ready to implement and test your idea, you're going to go to Replit, and hopefully you've made an account. And then you're going to, okay, so I kind of Python, but have one person be the driver, um, meaning that person will write the code and you as the group members, you tell them what to do. Choose one person to be the driver. It's just, it just goes by quicker, much easier. And then if you want everyone to be able to look at the doc, you just go to the share right here and you copy the link and drop it in the chat of your group so you can all look and work on the document at the same time. But once again, have one person be the primary driver. All right, so that being said, I think we are ready to break into groups. I'm going to once again go back here. Remember, it's Women Who Code San Diego. It's bit.ly slash Women Who Code San Diego dash big O. And we're going to give you about, I think, like 45 minutes, 40 minutes, 40 minutes. Thanks for saying that, Kat. I almost forgot to, to put the time. <laughs> um, I'm going to pause the recording. Oh. All right. Welcome back. <laughs> or for those of us who are watching at home, hello. <laughs> so um, how did everyone feel? Go ahead and drop in the chat. Like, what were, how far were you able to get? Did you implement your code? Did you solve the algorithm? Like, where are we? What's, what's the house? What's the deal? I want to see. <clears throat> okay. Okay. <laughs> well, the good news is we're all here to just learn and hang out so like no worries if you didn't uh figure out um okay okay cool so it's no worries if you know your code didn't run whatever like the, these things happen right like i've definitely submitted code that the goal is to submit code that runs but i've definitely submitted code that hasn't run before and that's fine right you're you're just doing the best you can do um and also like these aren't the easiest of problems either um, they are designed to make you think a little bit and work a little bit harder, right? So no worries if you haven't, um, you know, done like your perfect, most efficient solution. But right now we're gonna go over um, the solution. <clears throat> so what technique did you all use to try to solve the problem? I see someone did sorting. Um, Okay, I'm going to go ahead and let's see, do a share, another share of my iPad. And I'm going to just quickly, just briefly go over what the solution is. I'm not going to go over it in depth um, just because, um, well, you'll see why in a moment. <laughs> okay, so. All right, so I think you can see my screen. So we've got. <clears throat> We've got this. So we've got a sorted array. Wait, can you can you all see this? Can you just just drop in the chat if you can see this. Okay, cool. All right, awesome. So we've got we want to sort an array here. I'm going to assume that you've done all your pi Um and now you're at your idea and you're like, okay, this is an array. Can we use a two pointer technique? And the answer is yes, you can totally use a two-pointer technique here. Um, now, one of the things that often people do when they approach a problem like this is like, oh, let's go ahead and just like, you know, square then sort. And you can do that, but what is the issue with um, sorting? Like what's the runtime of most sorting algorithms? Does anyone remember? Yes, it's O N log N. And the thing with the two pointer technique is 
you can actually do it in linear time, which is better than O len O N log N. No worries, I knew what you're talking about. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's O N log N. So let's go ahead and oop, we're gonna we're gonna skip that <laughs> and let's go ahead and show how we would do that. So I'm gonna have um, well, you know what? I Okay, I will copy this, I'll, but don't don't look at this because I'm going to explain it to you. <laughs> okay, so let's say that we have. Um, so I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this. So <clears throat> what's the problem of just like squaring and sorting? We or just squaring. So if we square this, we have forty nine nine. 4, 9, 1, 21. And we want it to be this here, all of these numbers here are in sorted order, but we want the end product to be in sorted order. And if we just sort it, it's going to use O n log n, right? So what? how can we use pointers to make this more efficient? Well, one thing about, <laughs> we all know about negative numbers and positive numbers, um, <clears throat> when you, when you sort things in order from negative to positive, the negative values go from the largest absolute value to the smallest absolute value, right? Like negative seven is less than negative three, right? So it's going to be in that order. We also know that positive numbers are going to go from the least absolute value to the greatest absolute value because that's just how we sort things. Uh, two is smaller than 11. Negative seven is smaller than 11. Um, so what can we do? Well, instead of putting our pointer right here and right here, like we did last time, we can put our pointers in such a way that we can go through, we can iterate through the numbers from smallest to largest in terms of absolute value. So how do we do that? Well, one way we can do that is, well, how about instead of going here and here, like putting my pointers there, what if I take my pointers and maybe I put it here and then iterate this way? And then I take the other pointer and then iterate this way. And then when I'm putting the array together, I sort it based on that. I compare. I can I should do this in other colors so it's like more it makes more sense but when I'm iterating through the j coordinates I'm going from lowest to highest and when I'm going through the i coordinates I'm not necessarily going from high lowest to highest in terms of value but when we go from absolute value it totally is right the square of 3 is 9 the square of 9 is 49 like we're the it's going from smallest to largest but in opposite ends and that's how we can use our two pointers so this is what i would do now perhaps we could create another array and we but how do we know where to how do we know where to start well we can maybe take our coordinate j, we just go ahead, our coordinate, our pointer j, we go ahead and just have it start at the first one, right? And we ask ourselves, is this a positive number? No? Okay, let's just keep moving. Is this a positive number? No? Okay, let's keep moving. Is this a positive number? Yes? Okay, cool. I know that I want my other coordinate to start here. Coordinate. Why do I keep saying that? It's pointer. <laughs> I want my other pointers to start at the, the negative one. So what basically what that algorithm is, the first part of your algorithm is start at the first element and then keep going until you reach a positive number. And once you reach a positive number, then put your other pointer at the negative number. And what you're going to do is you're going to have your one pointer go this way and have your other pointer go this way. Okay, so let's do it. 
So J is, um, and remember, we want to sort this, right? So we're going to compare, the, we're going to, let's, yeah, we're going to square and then compare the values. So what is I squared? I squared is nine. What is J squared? It's four. Is I less than nine? Nope. So what are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and stick J in. And it hasn't reached the end, so let's go ahead and move forward. Okay, what is J squared? It's nine, excuse me. What is I squared? It's nine. Is I less than J? No, so let's go ahead and put J there. I'm arbitrarily just putting um, one in front of the other. You can ask, is J less than nine? And make that be the, um, the order. I think it's easier to go um, I less than nine. Okay, so we put J there, and now we're going to move, move it up. Okay, what is J squared? 121. What is I squared? 9. Is 9 less than, or is I less than J? Or is I squared less than J squared? Yes. So let's go ahead and put in I. And then we're going to move back. What is J squared? 121. What is I squared? 49. Is I less I squared less than J squared? Yes. So let's go ahead and put an I. And we're going to move it back. Uh oh, it's less than zero. So we're no longer going to look at I values anymore because the I index is less than zero. So now moving forward, we're just going to keep iterating through the list and only look at J values because I is less than J. So we're going to just go ahead and stick in J, which is 121. So what do you see? You've got a sorted array, and you didn't have to use the sort function. You did this. You you did this. You did this <laughs> in linear time because yes, you visited all the values, but you didn't have to sort them afterward. So is O n is linear time less than um, o n log n? Yes, it totally is. So this is the most efficient way uh, for you to sort. Um, is there a good way to avoid squaring the same number over again with each comparison? Um, I guess you could store it, but honestly, um, yeah, you could use absolute value as well. Um, and to be honest, like, it's such a, like, squaring is such a, like, minor operation, like, it's, like, a constant operation, so, like, I, w it's not really that much of a big deal, I think, um, so that's, in, in my opinion, it's not, um, it's not that big of a deal, but yes, you can use other ways. Okay. Cool, I'm gonna stop the share and go to the other screen. All right, cool. So if you, once again, these slides are gonna be available, um, but this is pretty much explaining what we just did. And we already did that. And if you look at the implementation, this is in Python? Yes, okay, so this is in Python and it's pretty much what we just said, right? So You've got, okay, so n equals the length of the um, the list. You've got, you start j at zero, which is the first index. And so while j is less than the length, right, you're going to just keep iterating, right? Just keep moving j through that array. And once it's no longer, once it's, once the number at j is no longer negative, then you're gonna set i less to, or one less than the J index. Now, this question, uh, the question that, you know, is inspired from this is, well, what happens if there aren't any, um, like, negative, um, like, what if there aren't any negative values and it's just positive? Um, that's fine, because, or if it, you know, vice versa, there aren't any positive values. That's fine, because if you look at this while loop, it's while I is um, greater yeah, while i is greater than zero, and while j is less than the um, 
the last index or the length of the index. You're going to, you know, you're going to compare the values there. But if, but once that's no longer true, and while like, say you only have like negative values from now on, well, as long as I is greater than zero, then you're just going to keep iterating and just only focus on the I values. Or as long as J is less than the length of the array, then you're just going to keep going and focus on the J values instead, not comparing to the I values. So you're just going to, like we did at the end, just plop in the J values. That's what you're going to do. Um, so that takes care of that. So that is that is it in a nutshell. Hence, that is it. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're actually at time here. Oh, we're beyond time. Um, so what I'm going to do is pass it back over to one of the hosts. Um, there are some study resources here that I recommend. And if you ever have questions, there's a there's a few ways that you can reach us. So you can either drop a question in the meetup event itself, um, or you can like reach out to us um, in the Women Who Code Slack and I can explain it further. Um, but honestly, I think that if you just go through um, the code and like implement it and test it out yourself, I think you're gonna start understanding more like intellectually how that works. So, all right, cool. I'm gonna pass it back over to one of the hosts and we're gonna end off. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks, <Jillian. Kat. laughs> um, I'm gonna stop the recording, but.